morning, everybody. So I am happy to inaugurate a new chapter in uh, resistance recovery. I am joined by my friends and colleagues, Corey Gamberg and Joe Curran. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna hopefully start a series of conversations that we're gonna call <clears throat> depth recovery. And so this is really kind of a way to explore the relationship between the 12 steps and the analytical tradition <clears throat> left to us by Carl Jung. So by way of starting, I just want these guys to briefly introduce themselves. Corey? Yeah. Uh, let's see, like Pierre said, I'm Corey. I uh, work at Rockland Recovery Treatment Centers with Joe and Piers as a clinician. Uh, been in recovery since July 2010 and kind of been working in the world of young since probably 2016 or so. Um, excited about the conversation. Joe. Uh, yeah, I'm Joe, and I am one of the partners of Rockland Recovery Treatment Centers. Um, I've been in recovery, actually, next week will actually be 10 years, February 28th, so uh, just about 10 years. I've worked in the field for most of that time and um, been really sort of working with Young's work or dealing with Young's work for probably the past five or six years anyways. So just for the sake of um, setting the conversation up, uh, all three of us are drug addicts, alcoholics who found recovery <clears throat> through the 12 steps of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which in a way puts us in a you know, slightly different category. Um, but all three of us, unlike a lot of our peers who are diehard 12 steppers, we felt limited by that world pretty quickly. I mean, in my case, it was inside of a couple of years for sure. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's comparable with you guys. So maybe, um, Maybe talk about the nature of that limit. What was that like? And why did Jung, not that he answered it entirely, but what was it about depth psychology that offered a way to grow? Mm. And whoever wants to start can start. Um, I mean, I think... <clears throat> You know, so a little, I think a little bit of the backstory is, and, you know, and Corey and I have worked together and been friends more or less since the beginnings of our recovery, um, you know, and I think sort of to parrot what you said, but I think it was probably, at least for me, I was, I was probably like two, two and a half years sober when, you know, the, the 12 steps, and I don't want to say the 12 steps in the entirety, but this idea of just like writing inventory and doing mindfulness meditation for a few minutes and pray, you know, doing discursive prayer sort of started to run dry for myself. And, um, you know, I actually, before I got into young, but I think really more than anything, what really sort of started to kick me off down this path, not really sort of, I wasn't, I wasn't looking for it. I actually moved into a room and there was a book on a nightstand that was uh, titled uh, Prayer of the Heart and Christian and Sufi Mysticism. And uh, I read that book, and in that book, it introduced me to the Jesus prayer. And so I practiced the Jesus prayer, and I had sort of a pretty profound experience the first time I did the Jesus prayer, and um, sort of caught me by surprise, where I was, holy shit, like, what is what is this, right? And uh, so, of course, I jumped onto Google after that and looked up the Jesus prayer and 
very quickly it led me to centering prayer when Thomas Kidu. So I sort of really got into contemplative prayer and, and centering prayer and both Corey and I went on treats together uh, for centering prayer. But it was actually, it was shortly after that, probably, I don't know, or maybe you know better than I do, but I'd have to say within a year after doing that, maybe a year and a half, um, Corey, and he can probably rip off this a little bit, was uh, introduced to an old Oxford group practice uh, that was sort of the beginning of our um, young experience. Yeah, yeah, I would say the same. I mean, I think it was between, you know, somewhere between two and three years of being in recovery that seeking turned into longing and trying to find another something deeper to touch that part of myself and originally i think that was found for both of joe and myself in the contemplative tradition so getting into centering prayer and you know chewing on things in the mystical world and reading merton and keating and all those guys and having really profound experiences that were way more palpable for me at least than I was getting by writing 10th step or even sponsoring people and doing book work over and over. Um, and I just thought right away, okay, well, this is probably really the point of this whole like growing spiritually thing is to get outside of that dogmatic routine and find other things to bring back and make it better. Um, so I think we ran down that road for a few years. Um, and then, you know, the, similar to what Joe said the, about his introduction to that book is the same way that it really happened with Jung, at least in my life. And that's why Jung has become so meaningful to me because I was never looking for it. I knew his name through chapter two in the book. And, you know, that was really it. I danced around some shadow stuff maybe but I never knew anything about Jung and then in 2016 I really started to have some sort of psycho-spiritual crisis in a way and I was looking for new things to do beyond the 12 steps and someone who's been on the YouTubes a lot James R who's my sponsor at the time had advised me to reach out to this other fellow who had been in AA for I don't know 50 years at that time and was really trying to revamp the practice of two-way prayer, which was this old Oxford group thing. And I spent some time doing that with him. And, you know, he very subtly one day said, you know, what we're doing here is what Jung called active imagination. And that was this, this moment that changed everything because not only did it do this, which is he said, start finding somebody to do this with and share. So Joe and I started to do that and share. So this notion of Jung's theories that we didn't even know about were already being experienced like the collective unconscious and how yeah. similar Joe's and I's writings were, even though we never spoke about them until the day we shared. Yeah. So there was this thing of, uh, it just really fell into my life at, the right time and put what was happening in my life into a context that I could understand. Yeah. So a couple, there's a few things in there that I don't think we've ever discussed or I've thought about. Um, the one thing that you're both saying that is true of me too, is there was, and I think this makes us different than a lot of Jungians is we got caught and not caught, we were attracted and were moved by the contemplative tradition as sort of a means of getting into Jung. Mm. Um, and so in my case, it's, uh, you know, I'm a lot older than you guys. So Jung's always this sort of thing over here that, you know, you run into it and you read this and that, and it's always there. And, um, and then, of course, I got acquainted with Robert Sardello, who really is the guy who brought me into a contemplative place. And he has a, he wrote the introduction of a book called um, Jung and Steiner. Mm -hmm. Quite a good introduction. I can't even remember the author of the book. 
but in it, uh, Sardello said that, you know, he's talking about what he does, what he called spiritual psychology. And he said, you know, Steiner is this sort of wizard of the spirit, but from Jung, and I'm sure that Sardello gets this from his long association with James Hillman, uh, Sardello said, from Jung, we learn about interiority and image. Mm. And those are two things that are just conspicuously well, more image than interiority, but both in a way in the 12 steps. At the very least, we, we do interior things in the steps with a four step and such, and maybe your 11th step, but we never language it. Mm. We never... Um, it's incidental. And then the image piece is just like not even really there. It's yeah. just all, it's all mental book kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, and also, you know, we don't, uh, just for the record, we don't have to ab abide by the conventions of Alcoholics Anonymous here. So James, <laughs> James Ryan can be James Ryan. Oh, okay. That's yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> And I'm saying that as a setup, um, <laughs> uh, but you guys got pushback uh, working in the field for doing this. Um, I mean, did yeah, you, yeah. Well, yeah. it was. I don't know if it was so much pushback. I mean, in some ways, right? So, so like we would bring contemplative prayer, centering prayer, two way prayer to to colleagues and people and even people in recoveries, you know, and it was always sort of met with, oh, cool. Yeah, nice. And then just, they just continue to go about their day and didn't really seem to be too interested in much that we had to say about it. Um, you know, I wasn't outright pushback, uh, like, no, don't do that, or you can't do that or anything like that. But it just, I, what I found to be interesting is that people in recovery in the 12 steps who were, you know, 12 steppers, they were book, big, big book people didn't seem to be interested out in spirituality much outside of 12 steps. Yeah. And, and I think something that's interesting to Joe's point is that the people that we would introduce these things to who were six months in treatment, a year sober, would eat it up way more than the people who were three, four, five, six down the line years sober. And looking back, it's really this interesting dynamic of claiming to be open-minded and willing to grow along spiritual lines, but really being stuck in the dogmatism of the specific orthodoxy of the big book. Yeah, it was and, even when even, sorry, not to cut you off for you, um, but like, even when Corey and I would go to, I'll never, you know, we, Corey and I went to um, a centering prayer retreat that was led by Father William Manager, and who actually just, Corey just told me he just passed away the other day. Uh -huh. um, but he said, uh, he, he quoted and he stole it. I mean, he, he quoted the Buddhist and he said that the finger that points to the moon is not the moon. And, you know, we could lose to riff off of what Corey was just saying, but they get just get stuck within the confines of the 12 steps. That is, that is the end of the thing where, no, this is just sort of that, that carries you further. Yeah. I mean, I've encountered, I would call it pushback and taboo where people have said, why isn't it enough? Why aren't the steps enough? As though mm. your, your inquiry is somehow a form of restlessness mm -hmm. with at the same time as an indictment mm -hmm. on your 12-step recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt that way, for sure. And I think that I experienced, I mean, I think of one experience in particular that I was invited to go do something, but I had scheduled to do a phone call with this guy who I was doing two-way prayer work with, and it essentially turned into a joke. And I remember taking that experience and going, I'm done with this. 
<laughs> you know say a joke if the people ridiculed you for, for yeah. 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 yeah because yeah. i was gonna go spend you know two hours on a thursday night doing this stuff versus whatever else and i just had this moment where i said i'm getting way more out of these things in my life now than i am out of all of this yeah and, and this this world and yeah i just think that you know and i think that we're seeing it too i think we're seeing it now over the last year or two we're seeing people that we've all known who have years of recovery relapsing or we're seeing people that we all know who have years of recovery all of a sudden stepping out of the box but doing it in this i can't really put my finger on it in the sense of just not acknowledging that it's the fact that the steps aren't going to be the thing for the rest of your recovery, but they're spinning it in a different way because it's like, if they say that there's something that maybe it's to that point where you said, Pierce, there's just some sort of ridicule around it. If you say that it's this thing of, well, you're saying now that the 12 steps don't work, but that's not what the point is, right? It's the point that it's just the vessel that gets you started. Right, which was what Bill said when he said it was a spiritual kindergarten. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. Yeah, and I mean, it, and just to go off that a little bit more, but you know, it was, it was probably right around that, you know, so Corey meets this Bill Wigmore, the father Bill Wigmore, who's the Episcopalian priest down in Texas, who introduced um, Corey to, to two way prayer, but it was right around that same time where we started doing it that just like how Corey had that experience of being like, you know, I'm done with this or, you know, getting ridiculed and saying I'm done with this, but it was right on the heels of that where I read the whole Tropic Breathwork book and I thought, I'm going to do this, but it came, but I also, you know, at that time, you know, it's, it doesn't seem to be so much of a, a, a big deal now, uh, but at that time it was sort of, you know, there was a black cloud that followed the idea of doing holotropic breath work. And I think it was really the phrase altered state of consciousness that really freaked people out, especially addicts, because when you think of altered states of consciousness, obviously you're thinking of getting high or something like that. So I just think that phrase really freaked people out. But I can remember being like, before I did it, like this conscious decision of like, if I do this, and it comes out that it's probably going to um, come with some baggage. Mm. And, uh, but at the same time, deciding that it, I was gonna do that. I mean, it re was really like, it was, it was centering prayer and then we got two-way prayer. And then for me, it was, I did, two-way prayer. And then probably six months later, I did holotropic breath work. And probably within that same month, got a young unit analysis so it was just like it was like boom 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 right back to back to back and um well, the, the experiences i was having in breath work and would bring them to my young unit. oh you would because yeah. of the imaginal stuff of, of the what the images yeah. yeah so you know it's really striking i think this this needs to be said that that's 65 years ago. Yeah. The and breath work was definitely 2016. I thought two-way prayer was before that. But regardless, it would have been 2016. Inside of a decade anyway. Yeah, yeah. And we've, we've literally watched this thing where, you know, there are prominent leader folks uh, in the recovery community. In the, and when we say recovery community on this show, we mean in the rarefied world of big book recovery community yeah. Um, who would actually insinuate that holotropic breath work was a relapse Yeah. because flat it would say it, not, uh, in, not insinuate. Some people would flat out say it. Right. And, yeah. and it's all about this non ordinary state of consciousness, which is, you know, part and parcel of recovery. Mm -hmm. I mean, reading a fifth step is not an ordinary state of consciousness and making a scary amends certainly isn't either, no. or, or a powerful third step for that matter. No. Um, 
So there was this really kind of rigid, fearful, quasi-fundamentalist thing. And here we are five years later, and that does sound as ridiculous as it is <laughs> to most people. Yeah. You know what I mean? You say that to most people, and they're like, what? They, well, they I say, mean, think what? So, so, I mean, not to like, I know we may be going down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but you know, you just have to, you just have to study some AA history a little bit and not understand that they were, you know, I mean, Bill and Lois, and they were using Ouija boards and doing seances and, you know, don't tell me that's not an all state of consciousness. Not to mention doing yoga in the 1930s. You know? Yeah, um, right. Reading Gurdjieff. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so it's interesting. So all of us get kind of primed for analysis. Uh, really through the steps and through contemplative practice, maybe holotropic breathwork. I too did holotropic breathwork before I ever went into analysis. And so then we all enter into analysis and maybe uh, speak to what that experience was like and especially how it differed from any kind of uh, conventional therapy and or sponsorship relationship. Mm. Well, I mean, for me, I think that my time in analysis has been quite unveiling. And I think that you go into analysis, I, if this is my experience, right? I, would, I go into analysis with, a, with an idea of who I am, the same way that I enter into the step process with this idea of who I am. And then, you know, whereas in the step process, I'm confronted with shadow material through my inventory. In analysis, I'm really confronted with it right away by just this authenticity that it takes to really see something out of your analysis. You have to go in there and kind of bare your soul in order to start working with the inner material. And I think personally, sponsorship can be that sort of relationship in the beginning, but over time, it seems that if you're going this way and your sponsor is staying put, that that becomes very difficult to do. Mm. And I think that that is something that happens to people. Um, so I think that for me, it was a very unveiling and is a, still very much so a very unveiling process and you know i think i was having a conversation with a client the other day who was just like i have a total aversion to therapy i just hate it in general and i said i think i felt the same way and then i got into analysis and i realized this isn't really therapy this is something much deeper this is something that i really can consider almost some form of spiritual practice in my opinion uh, because it's bringing me down into the depths. You know, Jung has this really, uh, it's somewhere in the collected works, he says something like the highest truth resides in the roots of your depth, not in the spirit. And that really makes me like think about this idea that the steps is really a spirituality of spirit. You know, it's ascending, it's about love, it's about spirit, it's about kindness, altruism. And then Jung is a spirituality of depth and truth and knowing yourself and i think that that is something that i've gotten out of analysis that i wasn't getting from traditional 12-step recovery well i guess i'd invite you to unpack that a little bit more then so you know because to somebody who's listening to this who's a hardcore 12-stepper with no experience they would probably push back and say, no, I came to self-knowledge and truth through the step work. So the unveiling, what is it? It's unveiling of what? What's the qualitative difference? I mean, I'm, I'm totally with you. I just think for the yeah. audience's sake, we want to unpack that. I mean, I think for me, it's the unveiling of the shadow but in a in a much deeper way you know I, I feel like you know 
most people get this idea that the shadow is just repressed darkness, but it's really not. And it's also this, it's just this whole unlived part of the psyche. It's just this whole unlived part of your personality, both good and bad. And I think in the fourth step, in the fourth column, traditionally you see the shadow through selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking and, and fear. Whereas in analysis, it was more, okay, I see that part of myself, but now I'm going to go even further and see, you know, who is the inner version of Corey? Who's really controlling and pulling the strings here? And with that comes an unveiling of complexes. And with complexes, you know, for me at least, it gives me a context as to maybe why I react to certain resentments in this manner you know, what's being touched in the unconscious that is creating this reaction. Um, so I think it's an unveiling of deeper shadow material, deeper complexes. Um, you know, I think through, I think through practices like active imagination and things like that, that you become much more aware of this notion that Freud and Jung both said, which is, you know, you're not the master of your own house and you need to learn what's happening in the inner world. And that is where the, the, the depth of truth lies in those inner world interactions. And it's hard for people, I think, in the steps who lack imagination or lack any sort of willingness into the irrational to sit down and try to do a practice such as that. Um, it becomes this thing of, well, inventory is concrete. This is your imagination. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And, and how can that be more powerful than a piece of inventory? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess I had that thought for some period of time, but then I started having experiences working with this practice of active imagination, bringing my material to analysis and really learning to understand myself beyond just this label of you're a selfish drug addict, you have to act this way or you're never gonna stay sober. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I think the fourth step, fourth column of the fourth step, I mean, I think it's, I think it's good for what it's for, meaning like, you know, in, in digging at some aspect of the shadow, like a selfish aspect of the shadow or a fear, or fearful piece of the shadow, but, I think there's a lot of stuff in specifically probably in a four step that, you know, really wouldn't, doesn't necessarily like belong on there, but it's still in my shadow, if that makes sense. Meaning like, mm -hmm. meaning like there are things that are in my shadow that aren't necessarily resentments that, so therefore they wouldn't end up on my four step. Sure. Yeah. Um, and that stuff still needs to sort of be, worked with or dug at a little bit and I think that it was through working with my analysis or bringing my my dreams to analysis or the breathwork sessions or things like that it was getting you know it was getting me closer and closer to that thing. I always I also always kind of felt like you know analysis really I don't know in some way or digging at my shadow in that way or going deeper with it it, it I got to know myself better, but I also got to trust myself better because I got to know myself better. And and in the four step, it was always kind of behind this idea that like, you know, and, and, and I still hear people say, like, I'm a shitty person or like, uh, you know, I'm this bad, per I'm this selfish person. And it's like, well, then in that frame of mind, I don't really start to trust myself in a lot of ways because I'm starting to really like, always think of myself as being dishonest or selfish you know so analysis it kind of drove me away from that and drove me deeper into the self and believe me there was a, you know there's a like Corey said there's the good and the bad of the shadow and there's a lot of chaos that goes in the shadow still but um you know so it, it wasn't like this easy thing it was a struggle in the same way that I think that this, this is a struggle for people but um you know, I did start to learn myself better and, you know, I started to be able to trust myself. Yeah, and I think to that point too, just real quick, is that it also helped me to integrate that material. Yeah, because, you yeah know, that's the right way to say it. In the step process, it's like, you know, I write this inventory, I see all these things about myself and then the step process actually says, okay, now let it go. Yeah, you and, abandon it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it's almost like, 
well, I can't abandon an entire part of my psyche. I can't yeah. abandon an entire part of my personality. And then it leads to this notion that if I'm going to pursue recovery now, it means I can't be this person ever again. I can't make those mistakes ever again. I can't ever do a selfish thing. I can't. And that puts a lot of pressure onto the individual. And I think that young psychology is really fantastic because it preaches wholeness rather than perfection and and this understanding that if i'm going to be a human i'm going to be full of complexity and opposites and that part of me can never be abandoned but it has to be i have to figure out how to integrate it and allow it to live yeah i think i think you just nailed it this dichotomy between perfection and wholeness Mm -hmm. And I don't think that perfection is really like baked into the 12 steps, but I think there's a sort of cultural complex that goes around it where mm. and we see this all the time, where if you are, you know, doing your inventory and sponsoring people and made your amends and all that, and you have these persistent feelings of rage or vengeance or lust or whatever, then you're somehow not doing it. Yeah. You need yeah. to go back in there and eradicate those things. Yeah. And what we've seen, and I think in recent, well, it's probably been going on forever, but what we see now is we see these strange versions of the 12 steps where um, in Portland, they're calling this uh, conduct inventory, where if you're feeling certain things or doing certain things, it's tantamount to a relapse or actually saying that. Mm. If I'm if I'm like eating too much, you know, if I'm attracted to somebody I'm not married to, if I'm, you know, that's that's tantamount to a relapse. So it's gotten this very um shame-based kind of punishing thing. I mean, what was so liberating for me in inventory was, you know, I have a handful of resentments they've never left me and there's murderous rage around these resentments like Mm. you know i I made reservations in hell for these people (laughs) and to be able to go into analysis and talk about that without being judged without there immediately being a diagnosis there's something wrong with me yeah um was hugely liberating or even when you find out that other people have that same train of thought or think yeah, that right. same way. And then you go, you know, it's, it gets so bad that, you know, it, you know, in some circles of recovery that it, like, not even if you have those thoughts, but if you just have a bad week, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. And I think too, why young is so important to, to really be bringing into this world is because if you look at the stuff that like these like the conduct inventory would say is a is a problem young is going to say it's a symptom mm-hmm. and to write a piece of inventory about that and then write it off as if i've seen the result i've seen the answer to solve this problem i lose a total experience of growth and personal knowledge and deeper understanding of who i am truthfully and because I'm not responding to the symptom appropriately, I'm, I'm treating it as the problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. You're closing the door in effect. A hundred percent. Yeah. You're yeah. freeing it. Then yeah. the shadow's going to spit out at you in all sorts of weird ways. And that, and that's what, I mean, how many people have we known who have relapsed and then, you know, they, they've held on to the recovery persona for so long. And then when they relapse, they just, it's like they've been living terribly for three or four years but like they say i just didn't feel like i could tell anyone because i didn't want people to think i wasn't doing well that is terrifying state of consciousness to be in well (laughs) it is because behind it is i'll be shunned if you knew the truth about me exactly um and i've built this persona up and everyone projects onto it and i you know it's just craziness yeah um so the other thing I think that's, that happens in well, one of many things that happens in analysis that, that really doesn't happen in other places, uh, especially if we've been in the steps for a while, especially if we've sharpened the blade of inventory, we will 
go into analysis sometimes and um, it can happen any number of ways. Uh, you can go in there with a dream, certainly. And before it's over, or maybe it's 20 sessions later, the dream has revealed hitherto unknown parts of your psyche to yourself in mm. ways that are, I mean, literally enchanting. Yeah. I mean, it could be bad things it reveals, but the whole experience is it enchants your relationship to your soul and to your world and to your experience. Um, I never had anything like that after a point. Initially, the steps were powerfully enchanting. Mm. Alan P was a wizard and, and that's all true. But after a while, you know, what's so interesting is that's a, those are a spiritual techniques Whereas my psyche is producing these images, um, there's no prescription. The images are so mm. so particular to me and unique that it takes you in a completely different place. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know the more that I've read. Like this might take this might be a tailspin or something, but I, that's fine, right? Because the more that I've read Jung, now going and reading Nietzsche is making an immense amount of sense to how Jung is really just following his path. You know, Nietzsche is saying that the old myth is dying, and Jung comes in and says, You need to find your personal myth, but it's a personal myth, it's not a collective myth. And to your point, you, you know, if you can't have that experience of working with your personal images and how your psyche is unique in itself, then you miss out on creating and finding, you know, what your myth is, the story of your life, who Corey is, who Piers is. And then you just get stuck in collective personas for your whole life, you know, especially in recovery, I think. Yeah. That may have been off topic. <laughs> no, it isn't off topic. It's not off topic. No, I mean, the, 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 just sort of, as you were talking, Piers, and you were saying enchanting and symbolism and things like that, but I mean, you know, after, so kind of going back in the conversation, but, you know, when we started doing two-way prayer and really sort of listening to that inner voice and like Corey said, Father Bill said that, um, you know, it was really just active imagination, but it was, I personally think, and I actually still believe this of all of the practices that I've done, you know, since getting into recovery. So whether it's just discursive prayer or meditation or centering prayer or breath work or any of it, I think that active imagination was by far the most fruitful and most enchanting. And it was going inside or going into active imagination that images and symbols and different you know characters within the psyche really started to, to pop up for me and then I was doing work with those symbols or having dialogue with the characters um that you know I don't, put, I don't know how to explain it, but really would just say put me in a different frame of mind. Yeah, I think you would call it an expansion of consciousness. Yeah. yeah. And I think for the audience too, what they have to realize is that unlike 90% of their sponsors or more, an analyst is actually so trained, so versed in uh, myth, religion, anthropology, literature, that there's rarely an image that you can bring to a, a session that they can't, as Jung would say, amplify it. They can't give you some kind of perspective on your own psychic process that can't but enlarge your understanding. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the ego hates that. You know, the ego will stop people from doing any sort of inner work. And I think that happens a lot, too, is that I think there's a lot of people probably that we all know who are feeling this way. Read some books and make this little step 
but the ego stops them from jumping. Hmm. And I think that's a really interesting meaning, meaning the ego doesn't want to see control. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if so, I mean, if the ego goes, if you start doing inner work and really working with the unconscious, you know, what's going to happen is that the ego is going to lose some of its power and control because whether it takes the next 50 years or whether it happens piece by piece, session by session, the deeper self, what Jung would call the center of the psyche, this divine part of us is going to show its, going to show its head. And then, you know, it's the, the point of the ego is to then really connect to the self. If you've ever read that book by Edinger, you know, he talks about the ego self access. So if they get on the same wavelength instead of the ego being way up here in control. So I think people experience the desire to jump, but the ego power that the, the power that the ego has over them still is still so great that they convince themselves it's not right or it's not I'll relapse. It's too scary. It's not real. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Well, so what about so what about this? And this I'm going to ask Corey. I'm going to ask you this. But like, right? So you go to someone and you say, "Hey, I'm into," or you go to a twelve stepper. We'll say, and you say, "Hey, I'm into active imagination." They say, "Well, what does that look like?" And you say, "And you say, um, I I had dialogue with." Well, for personally, this was one of the things I had dialogue with this inner character named Alice, who's 360 years old, and it's a guy. And then <laughs> the, you say it to the 12 stepper, and they go, "Oh, that's crazy." So is that is that me hitting up against their ego for them to just shut it down? Like if you want my opinion, I, I'm going to say 70, 30, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, it, it's and that's this thing that happens to 12 steppers is that we claim to be the most open minded people in the <laughs> world and we confront you with something that you can't understand and it doesn't make sense. It's not real. Yeah. You know, I think that happens all the time. And, and I think that, again, like if you put that stuff into context and then you say, well, here's what happened. I went to analysis and we talked about this and then we amplified this image. I kept conversating and then I realized this about myself. Hmm. Then that grabs somebody and goes, holy shit, that's pretty wild. Yeah. And I think that's what was happening with two-way prayer too. Oh, yeah. Well, we definitely tapping into the collective unconscious. Yeah, and people were seeing that, like, to just to Pierce's point, people were getting excited about it. You know, there was some sort of igniting that was going on within them that gave them something to think about and look forward to and ponder versus, like, the same old, same old routine. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's this thing that happens and we notice it like we for the audience, we've done some things where we try to um, we try to look at the lyrics from a Bob Dylan song mm. from the perspective of depth psychology, or we do this all the time without thinking about it. We find ourselves talking about TV shows, movies, literature. And what this does is it it makes the characters or the lyrics suddenly way more interesting they're not they're not two-dimensional yeah. anymore they're like you, you're like you're you're in their inner process yeah and i think that it's alive it's alive that's right and i think that you know in this time we're losing that mm -hmm. towards one another and in some cases i think people are losing that in relationship to their own experience that they're somehow becoming uninteresting to themselves mm. um which is really profoundly disturbing yeah. yeah and i i think too like what you were saying that i totally agree I, I really think that you know living a symbolic life or living life through the lens of depth psychology really turns life into more of a playful game it turns your existence into more of a, a mystery to be solved and to be pondered and to work with. And it's more it, meaning. It, it's more exciting. Yeah. It, it, you know, and I think that we are losing, you know, what Joe and you got, you know, you said it's, it's alive. I think, and I think this is my opinion, but I think that the big book is not alive for the most, a lot of people anymore, especially people who have done big book work 
over and over, relapsed over and over, written multiple four steps, and then they go to some place and they do the same thing again. It's not speaking to them anymore, mm. you know? And I think that's a part of uh, the need to, for people to step outside of that framework. And I'm not saying to throw it away, but I'm, I'm just saying that there needs to be something that can bring can be brought into it to enliven it again for people. And maybe that's just my experience, but I feel like I've seen that with people. No, well, I mean, I think this is, you know, this is all in the territory of things we've been talking about. And I think we're gonna probably talk, maybe this is the right time in this conversation to talk about this, but, um, you know, it seems like addiction is getting worse. Right? And, uh, you know, it's mass addiction now and the demeanor on sponsees' faces or clients' faces, their facial expression, they're more checked out than they've ever been. They're, you can't, like you said, you can't get the spark in them. You can't get them to like get interested in it or liven up about it. And I don't know, you know, I don't, I'm hesitant to, I agree with you probably halfway. It's like, it, it's it steps, but I also think it's just, I don't know what you want to call it but the forces that cause addiction that are getting more powerful so the, what the steps used to be able to scratch they don't be able to seem to scratch as deeply anymore right um you know and there's a, a need to like you said just there's a need to go further yeah yeah i, I i'm in essential agreement with both of you um I don't want this this episode to be over with a, too much of a sense of these guys are sitting there bashing step work. Me neither. So, <laughs> yeah, no, because you know, for me, especially in early recovery, especially with somebody who's new to this recovery, um, I still think it's the strongest game in town. But I do think if it's going to have a future it's going to have to be in dialogue with these other things yeah. um, for, for the reasons Joe just stated. Um, so maybe, maybe, you know, as a way of beginning to wind down, we should add, talk about what we, uh, Rockland recovery, but what we see with the degree to which we introduce these ideas. Okay, so obviously it informs our own presentation whether we're explicit about it or not. Then two, we are doing groups focused on it. And then finally three, we've begun to make referrals of clients new to recovery to Jungians. So maybe just, you don't have to speak about all of them, but just some aspect of that. What was presentation? What was the second point? We do presentations. It also informs how we're working, whether we refer to it or not. And then the third thing was what we're sensing, seeing from the clients we refer to analysis post uh, treatment. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't, again, I agree. It's not like I'm not trying to bash the 12 steps or anything like that i mean i give credit to the 12 steps for saving my life um you know and and actually i get i get really irked when i see people online bash the 12 <laughs> who used to be 12 separates turn around and, and bash the 12 steps for saving me on some level so, um you know so i don't i don't want it to come off anything like that but i just think that um like we said it's just it's, it's the presentation of the client is different than it was when I first started working in this field. Like I was saying a minute ago, their demeanor and everything's changed about them and it's harder to get them interested in it. And I think that I agree with you. I think the 12 steps as far as a treatment modality are probably the best thing in town, but it's, it's harder to get people to get them into it or get the, to have the same effect that it used to. And, you know, so I think that the, the need to attach something like 
uh, Jungian psychology or um, Jungian work to the 12 steps to deepen the experience for the individual, uh, you know, is, is going to help them to re recover um, ease more easily. Well, what's your experience of running the groups dedicated to Jung? What's your experience of uh, our clients' response to that? Well, I mean, I, from my perspective, they seem to be really into it. I mean, they, you know, it, it, if you can relate it back to addiction, if you go into group and you just talk about Jungian stuff in general, it's hard to sometimes to get them to be interested in it. But if you can relate the Jungian material to uh, the 12 steps or addiction, and you can show them the parallels between the two and how, how close they are, then that, that will excite them a little that starts to grab their attention a little bit more. Um, you know, so I, I think that it has to be done in a tactful way in order for it to, to grab their attention. But I mean, you know, I'm just, you know, and Young was so close to the 12 steps, right? In the formation of the 12 steps, you know, so that 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 connection was, was always there. Um, why, Jungians never made it into the treatment world or the, the recovery world that much. I don't, I don't understand. I don't get why that didn't really happen. It seemed like it was a, a natural sort of, would have been natural for them to connect, but for whatever reason, it didn't happen. Um, you know, so I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do is connect the 12 steps and you know, the treatment world with the Jungian world and sort of combining them, the two, and showing how closely, closely they're related and, and why it's important, um, you know, to, to deepen your experience with 12 steps in recovery. Yeah. I mean, I think, too, that I've had, two, I've had multiple experiences where I think, okay, there's 30 people in this group three of them are really interested in this right? and then i've had the opposite which is there's 30 people in this group and 26 of them are on the edge of their seat so i think and you know i'd be interested to look at the particularities of that group in the sense of who's a younger drug addict or which group has younger drug addicts who might be more influenced by you know how addiction and the addiction forces in the world have gotten worse over time um or, and who's a seasoned drug addict. I think there's a difference there. Um, I think, you know, as far as like the presentation goes for me personally, it has changed the way that I read the big book. It's changed the way that I look at what's in the big book. Um, you know, I used to be, I mean, Jesus, I read the doctor's opinion on a Saturday night, probably for two years in a row. And it was just like, I'd go into that group by the end of the two years and I'd hit the play button and it would just run. And bringing this sort of new experience and knowledge out of my own analysis and Jungian work into the book has really changed how I deliver it. And that has been, I mean, honestly, that's been really beneficial for me because quite frankly, hitting the play button was just getting really redundant. Uh, so it re-enlivened that. But also I think if we present it in this way that the 12 steps is really in its own way, a path of individuation, and then explain that individuation as a path for you to figure out who you are and to become your, your unique self, I think people grab onto that. And it becomes much more than, I'm gonna do this to stay sober. It's I'm gonna do this, get sober, and figure out who the hell I am and what I, what I really wanna do and, and be authentic. And I think that, I think that, people do grab onto that idea of, okay, this is going to be more than just getting sober now. I think they're relieved at that idea. Right, yeah. right. That it's not about putting on a uniform and suiting up on a new team. Right. Ultimately. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's really interesting, like how you say that is that, to, you know, like we always talk about, but to train as an analyst, like you don't necessarily have to have a psychology background. And it's almost like the more 12 steppers that we can get that aren't necessarily in the 
or that they're bringing their own flavor to their sponsorship or to their big book work, that's going to make them a lot stronger. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not, every Jungian is not coming through the same educational background. And if we can get every 12 stepper to come from their own place of delivering the 12 steps, whether it's transpersonal psychology and the steps or breath work in the steps, Jung in the steps, Freud in the steps, who cares? If they bring their own thing, then that gives, it just makes the 12 steps that much broader for everyone to grab onto. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think that. (laughs) Yeah, no, it was kind of like when you were talking about hitting the play button, because I've had that experience too, where, you know, you go into group now and you don't even, you don't even have to pick up the book. You just know what it says, you know, and you sort of go into the group and you hit the play. And it's almost kind of like, as you were talking, I was thinking it was almost kind of like you were, it was almost like the, the book being literal versus the spirit of the book or the spirit of the 12 steps. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's like, you know, you used to go and hit the play button and you took it as literal, but now after having the young experience, right, you look at the book differently and it might not be so literal anymore, but it's the spirit of the 12 steps within the young Ian frame. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think that's what it could be said for doing something like, um, you know, what's the guy's name? Refuge recovery or something. Yeah. No yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Dharma, Dharma yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sure. Noah, yeah. Um, so then to wind down, you guys, and this is what this little sub section of RR is going to be. Um, you guys have come upon the notion of depth recovery, and it's something you're we're working out. I'm joining you, but it's mostly you two. And maybe just give some sense of what your imagination of what depth recovery is or would be. I mean, instantly when those words leave your mouth, the image that pops up in my high, my mind is is something beyond the twelve steps, the traditional twelve steps that we work in. It's like something that brings that further. Um, you know, but again, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's more to speaking to this thing that the addiction problems getting worse, um, both in meaning like the amount of people who are becoming addicted, as well as we'll say the strength of the addiction seems to be coming, getting stronger. And therefore, if that's the case, it's almost like the addictions adapted or something like that, but like, if that's the case, then just logically speaking, then the the recovery itself must be deeper. The addiction's deeper, then the recovery is going to have to be deeper. So, like I was saying, you know, a little bit ago, but like, although the twelve steps maybe used to be the deep dives fifty six years ago, we'll say it's just not, it's not what it used to be for whatever reason. And I think it has more to do with the strength of the addiction today. And okay, well, how can we make recovery stronger? How can we make recovery deeper? So, you know, we turn to traditions that go inside, they go deeper inside. And that'd be like young or, you know, Risa Bloch, interior castle, but you know, you know, it's going into the interior and going deeper into the psyche or the soul or the collective unconscious, but just taking the recovery, making it, um, you know, making it deeper, really. Yeah, I really, I don't really know what it is. And I think that's really, I think that's the really cool thing about it. And it's just like this thing that you just aren't talking about that's getting growing legs and getting more talked about and more things thrown at and it's really just this organic thing that's emerging and I you know the way that I kind of envisioned it originally in my head was depth recovery is going to be this thing that people can turn to when they feel dried or stale in their recovery yeah but then you know continuously conversating you know and hearing Joe's point it makes a lot of sense that, you know, if the addiction is getting worse and it's getting deeper and it's adapted, that we need a program or some sort of approach to the process that is a little bit 
deeper in itself and can be more enlightening or profound. I, I mean, I don't know if those are the right words, but um, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it, you know, it, or Corey and I have been saying this and I'm sure you too, Piers, but you know, like we've been saying for five or six years, you see people like this, they say things like I'm stale or I'm stagnant. Or if you go to a meeting, then maybe the guy who says, I'm rewriting a fourth step. They say, I'm going through the steps again. Those are all, those are all, what do you call them? They're sort of like, uh, Ropes. they're tells, right? Yeah, tells, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're tells, right? And, um, you know, and you're like, okay, but the, it's always interesting. It's like, their response is this. It's like, they go through the 12 steps and it brings them to here. And then they sort of plateau and they get there. And then here are your options. I can stay here and feel like shit, but I don't like that. And what's really interesting though, is people say, well, I started to feel better when I worked the 12 steps. So what do I do? Well, I should go back through the 12 steps again. But then what happens is they go, oh, and they move back to here. And then they go back through the 12 steps and they get to here again. Yeah. And then they feel like shit and they go, oh, and they just end up in this cycle of writing, I don't know, 16 four steps throughout their life or something crazy you know and it's and we're really saying and Corey and I have been saying this for years like hey there's this there's this whole other spiritual world outside of the 12 steps like go find it like I don't you know I don't if you're into Buddhism great you're into Buddhism if you want to become a devout Catholic like go become a devout Catholic if you want to get into young like get into young but like you you gotta go and I think that's the Corey's point it's like whatever you're interested in you do the 12 steps through that lens which is the same thing that the Jungians do which is you know my Jungian I think was uh, uh an actor or something like that um yeah and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah right and I didn't even know that right yeah. but like he went through the uh you know so it's sort of like he went brought Jungian through that lens and you know, and th that's sort of what we're trying to do, I think, with the recovery, which is we're trying to say, like, 12 steps are great and all. We support it. We back it and all that. But it's just it there needs to be more. It needs to be deeper. And, and we're looking at it from different lenses. I think, too, like, you know, I, I really believe that we need to bring soul back into addiction recovery. Yeah, you 100%. Know? And I think that you know, if you think about it in this way, like doing the 12 steps is like a preparation for a descent into soul. And, you know, depth recovery is kind of the process to, or potentially could be this, this process of, I don't know, soul encounter or soul experience versus, so that, that much more of a descending spiritual path versus the ascending spiritual path. And, and I think bringing soul back into the, the language of recovery is at the heart of depth recovery, yeah. Yeah, and it's sort of like the opposite of what direction the field's going because much of, sure. you know, much of the addiction field wants to spend all of your time up here mm -hmm. right? and they want to talk about the brain and give you medication and yeah. talk about the present and what's going on in the conscious and things like that. And we're all saying, no, 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 right? You gotta, you gotta go from here, and this is the heart meditation. But you gotta go from here, and you gotta bring, bring a recovery more down into here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I often think that the recovery movement, more than a lot of other things, could be really in souls. Oh yeah, yeah. this got the element of suffering is just ubiquitous, and then you've got things like massive amounts of trauma that'll be another episode we can talk about mm -hmm. um you know racism poverty chauvinism uh prison um, yeah. well trauma is a great one i mean i don't think the steps touch trauma no. at all no no and and you know that's not it's not I'm not even trying to say it as like a knock on the steps. It just seems to be a fact. Yeah, and, uh, you can say that about cognitive behavioral therapy. It doesn't yeah. trauma at and, all. But, but <clears throat> should active imagination and dreams will take you there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No doubt. 
Yeah, and I think just like real quick, I'm going to cut you off, but I think to your question a, a few times back, like seeing some of the clients who have tried analysis or some of the clients who have tried active imagination or seeing some of the clients that have talked about their dreams, there is that spot, there is that smile on their face or that weird twinkle in their eye for that moment when they're telling you about their experience, you know, yeah, so definitely. you you can see that someone who really does kind of try to uh, integrate that stuff into their recovery process, even at the beginning, has an experience with it. Yeah. You know? And I also think the audience should know that we're not, you know, this has actually been going on for a while, meaning mm. um, like your analyst, he sees this little group of, I mean, I'd like to know what percentage of his practice is people in recovery coming oh, sure. to him for the reasons we're talking about. Sure. Um, but then we've also, we between the three of us, we know quite a few recovery professionals that are in the analysis. Mm -hmm. And now there's some people really new to recovery. And one of the things that sometimes happens to me is I get pushed back about, you know, a lot of what we would do in the, um, in the industry, what, what we're talking about, the way it comes out in treatment is psychoeducation. Yeah. And a lot of people seem to act like, well, this is all great and good, but for new people, it's just too much. And I, I'm, I'm just, I just want to push back right here and now on that. Mm. If you don't hook them when they're 16 yeah. days over with yeah. that's something that's interesting, mm -hmm. you're going to lose them. Over, yeah. And, you know, these people do not want to do uh, a triggers packet. They don't want to do what they've done a million and one times. It has no, as Corey would say, has no flavor of soul at all. Yeah. It's just. And I think. It's all up in the head. It's all up here. And it's dumbed down head, too. Yeah. And I think, though, like to all three of our points, I think you used to be able to do that with something so simple as like the model of addiction. But even that over time is, is lost something. You know, I remember the first time I saw that 10 years ago, I said, holy fucking shit. I mean, I've been in treatment over and over again. I can't stay sober. And you've just pegged my life like that. Ten seconds, yeah. And, and just over time, you, you know, I, I even remember bringing people through the book and them having that experience. But then it very slowly, it just it lost, it lost its power. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point, now that there's people in the profession doing analysis and early recovery people in analysis, people in late long-term recovery doing analysis, there's something emerging from the collective of the recovery world that is pushing everyone in the direction that we're talking about, whether they know it or not. Yeah, yeah. You know? I could not agree more. Yeah. You, know, you look at things like holotropic breath work, which really should be more in deeper dialogue with Jung because it validates mm -hmm. Jung. Or you look at the way that just the dimension of depth is so integral to something like the Alcyon Center. You know, it's really, it's, it's got little rhizomes going everywhere right now. Yeah. yeah. All right. So for the audience sake, um, we're going to be doing this, I think, um, bi-monthly to start. And what we're going to do is we're going to probably prep the conversations by reading something small. So the three of us will read a chapter or an article, occasionally a book, and that will lead us further this conversation. Sweet. Looking forward to it. I am too. All right, people. Be Thanks, well. Cheers.